All right, so I am so honored to be here. Um, and I just wanted to kind of first and foremost start off by introducing myself. Uh, most of you probably don't know who I am because I just relocated back to the area. Uh, but I'm very excited and I feel so much at home uh, here in Utah. I was raised here. Um, I've been living uh, on the East Coast for the past 12 years and so it's really exciting uh, to be home again. So I'm gonna start off by who am I? So this is me uh, up at Oktoberfest. It's Snowbird uh, about to ride the zip line. My family. I have a 14-year-old daughter, um, and I wish she were here with us tonight, but she's at cheer practice. And um, I love that she's at that age where your coaches tell you something is mandatory, they take it seriously. <laughs> Whereas for me, everything is discretionary. You know, if I feel like going, then I'll go. If not, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I I'm going to go where I want to go that night. Anyway, so she's at cheer practice. Uh, so this is her. Her name is Kalela. Um, and this is our adorable little puppy, Rue. She's a red toy poodle. Um, she's one years old, and uh, we are really enjoying her be part of our family. Uh, my home. So I have three cities or states in which I consider home. Um, I'm, I was born in the beautiful islands of Hawaii. Um, has anyone never been to Hawaii? Yay, awesome. So I was born in Honolulu, um, but I was raised here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, and uh, I moved, we moved back east about 12 years ago. So we were living on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Um, and we just moved back about three months ago. So education. I went to Cottonwood High School. Anyone with Cottonwood Colts in the house. Yay, awesome. <laughs> um, so I went to Cottonwood High School. I went to the University of Utah, studied at the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Um, got my political science degree there. Um, and I moved back east for graduate school. I went to American University and studied at the Women in Politics Institute there. Um, and I like to categorize how many of you are totally into education, yeah? I mean, that's the purpose why we're here, right? I hope all of you are considering going to college one day. Um, and me having been through lots of years of school, um, I really value education. But especially in this day, in the digital age, in which why all of you are here today to talk about social media, um, I kind of categorize education into two categories, which is formal and informal. And so the formal education is like universities, high school, um, grad school, professional schools. The informal would be social media. And basically anything, um, everything out there it is an opportunity to learn. So YouTube, how many of you have ever taken tutorials on YouTube? Yeah, my daughter does that all the time. Um, Google, has anyone ever Googled anything, right? That's kind of the answer to every question these days. Um, thesaurus.com, even Wikipedia. Um, there's so many, numerous ways to get information, answer our questions these days. So I consider that all to be part of my education. Um, career, uh, for the past probably nine to 10 years, I've been serving as a consultant training uh, women, primarily three audiences, women, minorities, and emerging young leaders, um, particularly in politics on leadership and communication skills. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. And about a year ago, I launched a project called the Rethink Tank for Women. Um, and I, the Rethink Tank is essentially bringing intimate groups of people together with diverse points of view to have a conversation. Um, and I, I've thought a lot about how I want to run this session, and I want to run it that way. You know, kind of the, the old school model is me as an expert, you know, preaching to you, telling you, you know, what you should know. Um, but I want to engage the audience a little bit more. And so I want everyone in here to kind of envision yourself as an equitable partner. Everyone has equal voice in this conversation. So there'll be points in my presentation where I'll ask you, you know, to um, offer whatever insight you may have on whatever topic that we're talking about. So I highly encourage you uh, to participate. So, the Rethink Tech was inspired by three different quotes. Um, the first one is, you are what you think. You are never victims of circumstance. And so, I want us to really think deeply about what I'm about to share with you. Um, because the goal is to strengthen our minds and ultimately become smarter at the end of this session. Uh, the next one is, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve and that is by Napoleon Hill. And the third one is seek first to understand and then to be understood. 
Um, that was by Stephen Covey. So how many of you have read or heard of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Awesome. Um, and I just, as I've moved back, I've learned that they're starting to teach these habits in elementary schools and middle schools and high schools now, uh, which I'm a huge advocate for because you can, it is never too early to learn um, these seven habits. Okay, and a little bit of psychology behind um, how we can strengthen our minds um, and, and get smarter. So there are three stages of your mind. Um, and the first stage is your natural mind. Um, and this kind of uh, characterizes the, the early stages of childhood development. Um, and we are, at the, at the top, it says there, it, you are driven by desire. Okay, and you make irrational choices. So it's like a child who is, um, you know, doesn't know not to touch the hot stove, but they're curious. Um, you're acting upon, you know, your emotions and your curiosities and all of that. You're receiving a lot of, you're like a sponge, receiving a lot of information. The second stage is the conditioned mind. So as you become educated, you learn uh, from your parents, from your peers, from your teachers, um, your mind becomes conditioned, and so you understand the basic law, scientific laws, um, you know, things that are possible, things that are not possible. And then the third stage, which is the stage that we want to be in, is called the power conscious mind, where you are conscious of the power that you have to choose. And at this stage, you are driven by choice, um, and you're challenged to rethink um, every circumstance that you encounter. So I thought a lot about the framework in which I wanted to present tonight, um, and I want to focus on power and choice. Uh, life is a series of choices, and empowerment is simply acknowledgement that you have the power to choose. Now, how many of you in here feel like you have power? Yes, awesome. I hope so. <laughs> um, because every one of you do, and I want you to... Sit for a second and envision yourself at what point in your life or what's, uh, what day even did you feel most powerful, right? Where were you? What were you doing? Who were you surrounded by? Um, what was it that made you feel powerful, okay? And for me, um, being from Hawaii, this is one of the places in which I feel most powerful. And this is on the North Shore of Oahu, standing on the beach and standing in this pose makes me feel powerful, okay? So I want everyone to stand up. <laughs> and I want you to stand in doing the power pose. Put your arms up in the air. And I want someone who has the loudest voice in the room. <laughs> yes, okay, I want you to say, I am powerful, okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, now everybody together. One, two, three. I am powerful. Awesome. Okay, you may be seated. Okay, did you guys feel the energy shift in the room? I hope you all felt each other's power. So now that we all have power, we understand that we have power within ourselves. Um, we now have the power to choose. And these choices that we make can either be positive or they can be negative. Okay, and the more positive choices that we make, the more power we have. So our goal tonight is very simple. I'm breaking it down for like a third grader. Positive choices lead to a positive impact, and that is the ultimate goal. Our approach, our approach is to make smart choices, and smart choices encompass at least these three things. Okay, the first one is personal responsibility, okay? Understanding the consequences behind our choices. Okay, the second one is self-reflection and taking the opportunity to stop and think, you know, before we speak. How many of you ever made the same mistake twice? Yeah? Three times, four times, ten times, right? I'm continuously doing that. I'm continuously locking myself out of my car, out of my office. And so if we take the time to stop and reflect, you know, hmm, I made this choice last time and it led to this. Uh, if we think about doing that in the future, then it will result in less, you know, we won't make those same mistakes over and over again. And the third one is managing our behavior, uh, which is mindful action. So again, thinking before we act. Okay, so the next three steps we're going to do, and we're going to use our worksheets for this. 
Um, you're going to define your identity, find your voice, and determine your brand. Okay, so the first one is define your identity. Okay, so I want you guys to look at your, your papers, um, and you're going to answer these two questions. Who are you? Okay, I know that is a big question. And I know some people, and most people do this their entire lives. They're still trying to define who they are for themselves. Um, and how do you see yourself? So envision looking in the mirror. What do you see? How do you see yourself? Um, and this can oftentimes be articulated through I am statements. Okay, so I listed there are four options there. You can write I am and fill in the blank. Okay, many things that we can identify with are our name, for example. Okay, that's probably the first most obvious way to identify ourselves. Uh, social clubs, the school that you go to. I am a BYU student. I am a UVU student. Family, gender, social media. How many of you have a preferred social media outlet that you use and you identify with that? Uh, your faith, religion, oftentimes people describe themselves by uh, characterizing their faith. Your hometown, where are you from, the culture there. Um, your nationality, are you an American? Your profession and your ethnicity. So these are just some examples um, of how you can fill in the blank for your I am statements. So an example for me, I am a woman, very simple. I am a leader. And thirdly, I am a high impact trainer. Okay, so I want you guys to take a second and fill those in. And then we're going to do what I do for, uh, with a group of third graders. Where, you know, we have an assignment and then we turn and we talk. And we share what we wrote down with our neighbors. And then I'll ask a couple of volunteers to share what they wrote. Okay, so when you're done writing those down, I want you to quickly turn and talk with your neighbor and share down what you wrote down. Okay. Time's up. So any volunteers would like to share one of their I am statements? How do you identify yourself? Yes, right here. I am kind. I love that. It's beautiful. Okay. Yes. Yes. I am Bay You are what? I am Bay Area. Bay Area. Awesome. You're from the Bay Area. Yay. Welcome. Oh, I love Oakland. Okay. Yes. I am Beautiful. Beautiful. And back there. I am amazing. Amazing. I agree. And the last one. I am accepting. You are accepting. Okay. Awesome. Okay. These are all great I am statements. Um, when you go home, you can finish filling in the rest. Okay. So the next one is find your voice. Okay. So what is your voice? Your voice. You're going to answer these questions. What do you have to say? Okay. When you have your platform, what would you use it for? What do you have to say? How do you see the world? Okay, and these statements can be articulated through saying, I see or I think. Okay, and your voice, it's basically your perspective on things. Uh, your thought, your opinions, your gut reaction when you're watching a movie or uh, engaging with friends. Your emotions, your point of view, and your values. All of these things contribute to your voice. Okay, so I want you to take a second and write down a couple of I think or I see statements. And the third one is determine your brand. Okay, so what image are you projecting in the world? Um, and how do others see you? So this is kind of the ultimate question, right, especially with social media. Um, my whole purpose here is to encourage you to project your best authentic selves to the world through the social media outlets that you're using. Um, and if you kind of look at the evolution of this, it's basically how do you see yourself, how do you see the world, and how does the world see you? Okay, that's how you go from identity to voice to your brand. Um, what is your brand? It's your reputation. Uh, it's your marketing strategy. It's the lasting impression that you make on people uh, when you engage with them. It's distinguishing characteristics, and it is what makes you stand out. Okay, so example. So the, the, this is just my brand for my businesses, women, politics, media. 
Okay, so when you hear those three words, that's what I'm about. And the Rethink Tank for women, challenging women to rethink how and what they think. Okay, so I want you to think about, and actually I wanted to move to this slide here. Um, also, brands can be communicated through a symbol. So this first one, can anyone tell me what brand that is with the pink dog? Pink, right. How many of you are part of the Pink Nation? Yeah? Awesome. My daughter's like crazy about pink. All right, so that says to you pink. Okay, what is the N in the gray? Nordstrom, Nordstrom. good. How many of you have been to Nordstrom? Yeah? <laughs> awesome. And at the bottom, what symbol is that? The peace sign. Awesome. That is the peace sign. Um, I also wanted to share, I, I was in Africa doing a training uh, several years ago, and I put this symbol up on the board and asked them what it meant to them. And somebody raised their hand and said, that symbolizes unequitable distribution of assets. <laughs> um, fascinating, right? And so what that lesson taught me was that symbols can mean different things for different people, okay? So when you're developing your brand, um, make sure that it resonates with the audience that you're trying to target. So in your brand, and actually I wanted to challenge you, um, when you're coming up with your brand, it's important to ask other people how they would describe you, okay? Again, it's about the world... You know, how does the world view you? What are you projecting out in the world? Um, it could take years to build a brand. So uh, we're just learning the process, and then when you get to that point, hopefully it'll be the brand that you want. <laughs> and, yes, last one. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> All right. Okay, and just a quote on branding. Your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. Okay, so very clear, clean cut. Um, that was said by Jeff Bezos. Does anyone know who Jeff Bezos is? Any thoughts? Yes. Exactly right. Anyone shopped on Amazon before? Yes. Jeff Bezos is the founder and CEO of Amazon. So he knows a thing or two, or two about branding. Yes, he is a multimillionaire. Okay, some of Utah's digital branding experts. Um, you guys may know these people. How many of you have heard of Allison Faulkner? Um, she has the Allison Show. What is her brand? How would you describe her brand? It's awesome, right? Everything Allison says or does is awesome. <laughs> Anything else? I say fun and unique. Like she's not afraid to be herself. Yes, right. She's pretty awesome. <laughs> Unique, fun, awesome. Great. Um, and then the Tattooed Mormon. I, I've been hearing that she's another popular face in the digital space here in Utah. Does anyone follow her? Yeah? Awesome. Uh, what would you say her brand is? How would you describe her? What does she identify with? Uh-huh. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Acceptance. Very good. Okay. So now we're going to get into social media. So what is social media? Okay. It is simply a communications tool. Okay. And a lot of people can be, I don't know, most parents actually are overwhelmed by social media. How do you guys all feel about it? Like, are you super excited about it? Do you hate it? Or you're just like, it depends on the day. Yeah. You love your phone. Okay. Awesome. Um, yes. Okay. Good. That's a very mature assessment. <laughs> okay. So for most of you, and I think many of you in the room do not remember a time when we did not have access to the internet. Is that correct? Yeah. Has the internet been around your entire life basically? Yeah. Okay. Well, I remember, and this is how old I am. <laughs> I remember the day when we did not have the internet. Like the World Wide Web was simply an idea and a concept that people were talking about on television. Um, and so before social media, we had what we call traditional media, okay? So the way in which we exchanged information, we received information, were through these different outlets, like billboards. We still have billboards today. 
uh, but they were very more popular back then. We had radio, we had newspapers. How many of you read newspapers like hard copies of newspapers anymore? Yay! I hope so. Um, the television, how many of you watch TV? <laughs> and direct mail. So mail is also another form of traditional media. Okay, so all these traditional forms of media, they gave us exclusive access, meaning only certain people had access to those outlets. Okay, you had to go through editors and producers, and we called them gatekeepers, in order to get published or to get an interview or to get a billboard, you need money. Um, also, it only had a local reach. So only the people in that surrounding community or who are logging onto the television or um, who have access to that radio station could hear the information that you were sharing. And thirdly, all the content was reviewed before it was broadcast. Okay, so if you wanted to write an article or an op-ed, an opinion piece in the newspaper, you have to go through an editor who will kind of revise the piece um, and then give it an okay. So social media, I want you guys to understand the difference. Social media has open access. Who can participate in social media? Everybody. What, what is it called? You don't have to be a certain age or, I mean, certain sites you do. Um, you don't have to pay for it. Like, it's just open access for anyone and everyone who wants to be a part of it. Uh, the global reach. So, I mean, you can communicate with people who, from, who live right here in Utah County um, and people who live in China, in India, in Japan, and throughout the world um, with a click. And original content. You don't have to go through any gatekeepers. There are no filters. So whatever it is on your mind, you could just broadcast it right out there, throw it out into the world, okay? Um, there are a lot of benefits and then also consequences that come with these freedoms. But I want all of you to understand how privileged you are um, to have access to these, these outlets. So taking a look at the global digital snapshot, okay? Who could tell me the, the world population right now? How many people are living in the world? 7.4 billion people. And over half of those people live in urban areas, similar to like Salt Lake City in Utah County. Um, and if you look at the statistics in the center, 2.7 billion people are engaging in social media. That's almost half the world's population. And the last um, stat is 2.5 billion use social media through their cell phones. Okay, so how many of you, that is how you engage on social media, through your phones? Probably the majority of you. Um, who could tell me how many cell phones there are in the world? Lots. Take a guess. How many? 100 billion cell phones exist in the world right now. <laughs> so if you wanna make money, uh, go into the manufacturing mobile phone industry. Okay, women continue to dominate the digital space. So ever since social media got super popular, women have always engaged in this form of, of media uh, more than men. So in 2010, 68%, and 2015, up to 80% of social media users are women. So we are dominating that space. So I got this from how we perceive different social media outlets. And I got this from my 14-year-old daughter. So she says, Facebook is for old people. Is that true? Yes. That's probably how most of you would characterize Facebook, right? Well, I'm an old person. Uh, Instagram is cool, right? And it's for everyone, right? Old people, young people, people all over the place. OK, YouTube is the new television. Right? How many of you watch YouTube videos more than you actually watch television? <laughs> Most people, right? Because you can even see yourself on television. Uh, Twitter is for American presidents. It is how they communicate with the media and their constituents, right? I think President Trump has definitely redefined uh, the, the purpose and meaning of Twitter. Very popular. And Snapchat is where it's at, right? <laughs> so Snapchat, how many of you, Snapchat is your preferred 
form of social media. Um, it totally overwhelms me. I don't really understand it, but I know the young people, that's, that's all they, they engage on, Snapchat. Okay, so there are different ways in which we engage in social media. So the four C's of social media, and they stand for connect, courtship, which you probably don't use that term anymore, but I'll explain, college and career. So these pertain to the social, relational, educational, and professional aspects of our lives. Okay, so the first one, social. We use that to connect with one another. It's a social outlet, right? I mean, sometimes I, I wonder if young people ever engage in face-to-face -face conversations anymore because they're constantly, you know, texting or Snapchatting or, you know, posting tweets on Twitter. Okay, and I want us to kind of go through the impact of our choices um, in each of these categories. So the positive impact of being able to connect through social media or is your ability to share, right? Share information, share pictures, share ideas with your friends. Um, it's also a platform and an outlet. So it's a platform to say what you want to say. Um, you know, get it out there and share it with other people. Um, and an outlet. And it's also a news source. How many of you get your news, like what's going on in the world and in your community through your social media? Um, what are some other positive impacts of social media in connecting, yes, the social aspect of it. Yes, awesome. Oh, wonderful. That's, yes, it's a great organizing tool, right? I'm also informing people of what's going on. Um, so that's great. Any other benefits or ways in which social media has a positive impact in our social lives. Yes. Businesses. businesses, yep. It's how a lot of businesses engage with their customers, their consumers. Um, all right, now the negative impacts. Um, and I put negative, so this is challenges us to rethink our choices in this area. Um, so one thing is a false reality. You know, oftentimes, you know, we post things and as we're watching other people's lives online, um, we're, we're taking them for face value, right? Whereas it's, it's a false reality sometimes. And we start comparing ourselves to theirs. Uh, time consumption. Uh, how many of you spend way too much time <laughs> on social media? Or your parents may feel that way. I understand there are tools now that you can download to your phone that will shut it off at a certain time. Um, you know, to help you kind of monitor how much time consumption you're using on these. And competitive comparison. Um, how many of you sit back and like watch posts or watch or read people's blogs and start to see what they're posting and start comparing yourself to what they're posting? And um, you know, there are different ways in which we can respond to that emotionally and, and whatever. Um, any other negative impacts of social media? Yes. Yeah, people can share negative thoughts and negative ideas, negative perceptions of other people through social media. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I oftentimes feel like we're losing our ability to communicate face to face. Right? Yes. True. Thank you. That's a really good point. Yes, and I want everyone in the room to kind of understand that. You know, I want you to be very mindful and responsible about what you put out in the digital space because you cannot take that back. Okay, so make sure that it, you are being mindful about the choices that you make. Yes. So great. These are all good suggestions. Um, and one example of a positive impact, um, I have a dear friend, and actually many of you, have, you, how many, have any of you heard of Love Tassa? It's a popular blog. Uh, this is a dear friend of mine. Um, we went to the same church back in D.C. And she, I remember when she literally set this up simply to share photos of her children with her family um, because they didn't live in close proximity to her. Um, and then over the years, it's kind of built up a following. And she's like a professional at this now. Her husband, Josh, was able to quit his job to help support um, their blog. And now she's... She's like big in the blogosphere. Um, and so th this is one kind of opportunity. It, it could turn into a career uh, for you as well, too. Simply doing what you love. Okay, so it's relational. 
Um, how many of you ever like initiated a relationship or flirted with someone or tried to holler at someone through so social media? Awesome. I think we have all done that at some point. Um, and so it's relational. It, it's a way to kind of start relationships, um, seek other people out. So the positive impact, it's convenient, right? You don't have to leave the comfort of your own home to meet people. Um, you can have a strategic search, so you can kind of narrow it down um, to what type of person you're looking for uh, or what have you. Um, and then a minimal cost. Um, so I know a lot of men, and it seems like most of you probably have not started dating yet, like formally dating. <laughs> um, but, you know, usually the guy will have to pay for dinner or, or whatever. And so I know a lot of boys are extremely excited about social media or dating online um, because it doesn't cost them as much as taking people out to dinner like all the time, getting to know them. Um, any other positive impacts uh, in our, the relational department with social media? Yes. Yeah, great. Awesome. Yeah, if you don't live far or close to them, or if they don't go to your own school, uh, you can still communicate with them. So good point. Um, the negative impact. Um, areas in which we want to, may want to rethink. Uh, dishonesty, right? Some people can lie about who they are or make up stuff. Uh, false representation. Um, and stalking. Has anyone ever had somebody like stalk you on social media? <laughs> How do, how do you respond to that? Like, how do you handle that? Yeah? Any ideas? Yes. You block them. You can block them, unfollow them. Yep. Awesome. So I think every outlet kind of has ways in which you can handle that. Okay. The positive impact. Um, increased engagement. Um, how many of you, are most of you in high school, middle school? college yet? Yeah, mostly elementary, middle school. Um, how many of you have used your cell phones um, for educational purposes? I know my daughters use tools like Kahoot. Have you guys used that? Um, there are different games that you could play in class using your cell phones, using social media, um, and it increases engagement in the classroom. Um, new technological tools are being introduced. Um, and so you're being, becoming more familiar with the digital space and digital devices um, during your learning experience. And it's an endless amount of information. Uh, I mean, the internet out there just gives you uh, whatever it is you want to know at your fingertips. Um, any other positive impacts of social media as it pertains to education? Any other ways in which we use it to educate ourselves? Yes. Networking, perfect. Social networking can also be professional networking. Any other thoughts? Google Docs saved my life. I'm like a total Google Doc, Google Doc girl. Yes. Yes, online classes. Right, taking classes online. How many of you have taken a class online already? Awesome. My daughter's enrolled at Skyline High School, um, and they offer online classes like during the summer, even during the year. Um, and Offering online classes has increased enrollment in today's colleges astronomically. Um, so there's a huge, huge benefit. Um, the negative impact of social media as it pertains to our education. So I just jotted a couple down. It could be a distraction, right? How many of you, your schools allow you to have cell phones in class? Do they? Okay. <laughs> how, many of you, how many of your schools forbid cell phones in class? Right? Because it can be a distraction. Right? Um, the next one, it impedes our focus. You know, we're thinking about what's going on, what are our friends saying, versus focusing on what the teacher has to say. And the third one is cheating. You know, how many of you ever seen your peers or other people using social media to share answers or, you know, cheating? Right. So it's another temptation that we want to stay away from. Uh, back east in middle school, a lot of students have to interview in order to get into schools. And my daughter was interviewing for one of these particular schools, and there were a bunch of kids doing interviews all throughout the day. 
And so some of the students who interviewed earlier on in the day would share the questions in the interview on social media. So the students coming later could prepare for them. Um, and it, right, it wasn't the most honest thing to do, uh, but the school fortunately caught on and they started changing the questions you know, later on in the day. So kids couldn't do that anymore. But I would discourage you from doing things like that because you wanna just be yourself and be authentic in your answers. Okay, and then the last one is professional, your career. So the positive impact, um, setting up a professional profile online. Um, and I encourage all of you before you even graduate from high school to set up a professional profile online. This is where a lot of employers are going uh, to find candidates. Uh, professional networking. Um, there are sites like LinkedIn and even Facebook um, where people are making connections and, and doing work with each other. So professional networking. And then also job search and interviews. Um, I've interviewed for several jobs since I've been here, and a couple of them have been uh, through a video. <laughs> I had to record myself on a video and then submit it um, to the employer. So these are all positive ways in which we can utilize social media in our professional lives. Any other ideas on how it's positive? Yeah. Oh, meaning like on LinkedIn, for example. Um, you have a photo of yourself, kind of like a title, you've got your experience on there, your education. Um, so it's basically like an online resume, right, in a, a different format. Okay, the negative impacts. Any negative impacts? Uh, employers will Google you, okay? And this is what I want, really want the young women to understand. So be very mindful about what you put out in social media. Um, because employers will Google you and kind of see what you're associated with. What types of posts do you post? What types of photos do you post? Um, and are they aligned with their brand? Okay, so be very particular about that. And what image are you projecting online? So again, it's never too early to start thinking about these things, even though most of you probably will not be getting jobs for quite some time. Can we think of any examples of personal information that we would not want shared on the internet? I mean, right off the bat, your social security number. <laughs> Do not post that anywhere. Yes, what do you think? Um, phone, numbers. phone numbers, addresses, perfect. Okay, so as, as we're nearing the end of our session, um, I wanted to talk about a, a more serious topic. Um, and this is cautionary impact of social media on young women in particular. Um, so this is a book that was just recently released last month. Um, it's called What Made Maddie Run. Have any of you heard of it? Yeah? Yes, you have. Okay. Wonderful. So it was written by a sports writer. Her name is Kate Fagan. Um, and she was a professional basketball player. Um, and Maddie's story really resonated with her because she really could relate to the pressures that a lot of these competitive athletes have in college. Um, and so Maddie, this is Maddie's story. She suffered from depression, um, and the way I define depression, uh, it's self-doubt, it's loss of hope, it's having low spirits, um, and anxiety as well, well, too, which is worrying, being nervous, and feeling unsettled. Now, first and foremost, I want to make sure everyone understands that if you are feeling these feelings, it is perfectly normal. Um, I do not know anyone who has been on this earth who has not felt one of these emotions at some point. But if you are feeling this way every morning when you wake up and every evening when you go to bed and throughout the day for an extended period of time, I would encourage you to go to someone and to, to talk about it, right? Because that is not healthy. And Maddie, and looking at Maddie, this is the girl that I went to high school with, right? I mean, this is the girl next door. She was beautiful. She was smart. She was athletic. She came from a good family. Um, and for some reason or another, she made the decision to end her life. And I don't know how many of you know uh, stories of people that you may have known or friends who have other friends who have committed suicide. But it is something that is increasing um, in our communities. And it is my sole purpose 
um, here today to stop that from happening. Um, the reason why I want to bring in this particular story is because Kate Fagan talks about the impact social media had on Maddie's decision. And this is what she says. She says, on the compulsion to edit our lives for social media. This was something that Madison dealt with constantly. She knew that she was projecting an image of herself that was not real. And she articulated that to people over and over. And yet when she looked at her very close high school friends and what they were projecting on social media, she took it at face value. And I think we all do that for some degree. Okay, and just to share a quick personal story, I have a dear friend of mine who lives back east, and she was just like Maddie. And she was the best friend to everybody. Um, she engaged in social media all the time um, and projected this like very happy, energetic, and um, just healthy lifestyle. And one day we were on a walk on the National Mall and she was sharing some of her feelings uh, that she had been feeling lately. Um, and she was just feeling very discouraged, um, very frustrated, very lonely, uh, as if she had no one to go to. And, and the thought had crossed her mind that if she were to end her life, that no one would notice or would care. Um, and after a long, well, several hours of a very emotional conversation, um, I, I found myself turning to her and saying that if you ever have these feelings again, you better call me. Call me. Call someone. Call someone in this room so that we can remind you that your life matters. Okay, I don't know if any of you know anyone personally who may be in that situation, but may it be your responsibility, and I encourage you to be there for that person. This is the one thing that inspires me most about women, is because women support other women when we don't have the strength to stand on our own. And this is my phone number. <laughs> if any of you find yourselves in those situation, um, please call me. And I will remind you that your life matters, that you are valuable, and you bring a, a unique contribution to this world that no one else can bring. Your identity is real. Okay? Your voice matters, and your brand is secondary. And I say that because oftentimes we do it backwards. We get caught up in the perception our, how the world is perceiving us, right? Or how we're being perceived in the world. And we get caught up with our reputation and what other people think of us um, and feel about us. And we forget how we feel about ourselves or it brings us down. And ultimately, that's all that really matters is how you feel about yourself when you look in that mirror. Um, managing your emotions on social media, the relationship that you have with anything and anyone starts with the relationship you have with yourself. So if you are confident, if you feel powerful, if you feel empowered, you project that to everyone else in your life. And that's where we want to be. I encourage you all to follow your passion. Um, this is another quote. I was worth over $1 million when I was 23 and over $10 million when I was 24, and over $100 million when I was 25. And it wasn't that important because I never did it for the money. Okay, this was by Steve Jobs. And clearly he didn't care about the money. He wore the same outfit, jeans and a black turtleneck to work every single day. But he cared about being the best. He cared about creating something that could change the world. And each and every one of you in this room have that same capability. So may you turn your focus, your time, and your energy into developing that gift. In closing, I just want everyone, <laughs> thank you, um, to remember to stand in your power. 
to make smart choices and to simply be who you are because you are enough. You are beautiful, bright, and brilliant already. Um, and authenticity wins every time.